there and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And as always, I want to greet you in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, on behalf of Alice and Mark and myself. Uh, we're continuing on the study that we started a couple of weeks ago in Paul's first letter to Timothy. I think uh, we we're starting today in the second chapter. That's correct. That's correct. Before we do, though, I'm going to ask Brother Mark to ask God's blessing on our time in his word. Lord, in your word, you talk to the woman at the well about water that if you drink, you never get thirsty again. And Lord, that water is your word. And we just thank you for the refreshing word that you have for us. This Open it up to us so we can see your love to all of humanity, to get them saved, and to, to be with you forever. Amen. Amen. All right, so we are starting at 2 Timothy, right? Mm -hmm. No. No, 1 Timothy. Not at all. Not at all, right? 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 <laughs> Timothy chapter 2. I'm going to start right in verse 1 and 2. First of all, that's where we're starting. First of all, then, I urge that entreaties and prayers, petitions and thanksgiving be made on behalf of all men, for kings and all who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. Now, Paul wrote this letter to Timothy probably in the late 50s, like... Uh, 58 or 59 A.D., perhaps as late as the early 60s, right? Mm -hmm. So he's telling the body of Christ to pray for all the people who are in authority. But when he wrote that, I'll tell you who was in authority. Yes. Pretty evil Emperor man. Nero, the guy who lit up the night skies with burning Christians. So you need to understand that it's not about how you like them. It's not about how you regard them. It's about the fact that God put them in place for his purpose. Mm -hmm. That's what the word of God says. God appoints and has the heart of the rulers in his hands, okay? For his purpose, not for our purpose, not to make life nice and sweet, although that's really part of what their ministry ought to be, but to serve God's purpose. Sometimes God's purpose is to bring judgment. Yes. All right. But it says, you know, and Peter, Peter and Paul are in total agreement mm -hmm. in spite of what some people seem to have believed, right? So Peter at the same time, basically, in, in 1 Peter chapter 2, he wrote this, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. The church has a ministry. Our ministry is a ministry of reconciliation. Our ministry is to bring the knowledge of the presence of Christ Jesus into every place. Our ministry is to proclaim the love of God in all places. The world, the rulers of the world, they have a ministry God-given. Well, I don't know that they fulfill it very well, but it is to punish evildoers, to protect us from evildoers. Mm -hmm. Okay? That's their ministry. And all too often, they can become the evildoers. I, I think before we start to judge them too harshly, though, we should look and say, is the church fulfilling its ministry? Because we're the light of the world and the salt of the earth. If we're not fulfilling our ministry that God has called us to, it's no wonder that the world wouldn't have a clue as to what it means to fulfill their ministry. Also, in Romans chapter 13, it so, explains it more. It's throughout, yeah, it's, but yeah, there's a lot of it in Romans absolutely. chapter 13. Yeah. There is, because we are to be submitted to governing authorities. What does that mean? To obey them. What does that to, mean? To obey them in all the aspects that they have authority in. Because like, even the like apostles... Doing, like doing the speed limit? Yes. The apostles, the only thing the apostles didn't obey them in is preaching the word. It's it's when it's not, just, just, not just preaching the word. I mean, specifically. You're talking about... I, you're, you're right. I mean, you're, but you're talking about a specific instance 
when the Sanhedrin called the apostles and said, don't you preach the name of Jesus in Jerusalem? And they continued straight to do it. Because that's not in their realm of authority. Right. I promise you this. I promise you this. The government saying you can't preach the gospel, that's not them protecting anybody from evildoers. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Okay. That's not their realm of authority. But we need to understand that to obey and to be submissive to governing th authorities, that means the little things too. Mm -hmm. And the little things mean the parking rules. The, I use this as an example because like I say, you know, when I'm driving down the highway and I see a car pass me 20 miles an hour over the speed limit with a, some, a bumper sticker that says honk of your low Jesus, mm. it's, I find that very troubling. Because They're not disobeying the government. They're disobeying God. If you are disobeying the government, if you are speeding, you are being disobedient to God. Right. If you're parking where you shouldn't park, you're being disobedient to God. Because that is the realm of authority that God has given them. That's their right to make those rules. Mm -hmm. Okay? And we need to catch on to this and start doing it. Because if we're not faithful in the little things, don't believe that you're going to be faithful in the big things. Right. We are. But I want you to understand this. Because when it starts talking about us and the, and the, the church and the government, we are here on this planet. Now, it says in Philippians 3.20 that our citizenship is in heaven. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yes. We are heal here as aliens, sojourners, and strangers. We are just passing through. There's a song I love so much that we've, we've had the occasion to sing, not, not a lot lately. I am a poor wayfaring stranger, mm -hmm. wandering through this world of well. We're just passing through. Okay. We're not supposed to be attached to any place in this world. We're not. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. That seems to be something very, very much uh, a major question in the church today, because the church seems to be here in places that we go. I'm to, and I'm, when I say we go, I'm talking about here in the United States. I'm talking about in the United Kingdom. I'm talking about in Europe. I am talking about in Africa. The church gets so embroiled. In, in politics, that they don't understand that God has told them, well, has God told them to do that? No, they'll say yes. Well, <clears throat> you, you, they can say anything you want. You mm -hmm. can say you're a banana head, but I mean, <laughs> that doesn't necessarily make you a banana head. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If God hasn't spoken it to you, then you're not doing it in faith. And if you're not doing it in faith, anything not done in faith is sin. We have 90 years of church history in the New Testament from the birth of Christ until John on the island of Patmos. It's 90 years. There's no place in there that you will find that the instruction of God is to become partakers in the world system. To go out and look. That was what the zealots were doing in the yes. time of Jesus Christ. They caused no, nothing but problems. The only time that it was that you, that people might argue that it was done is when Paul appealed to Rome. He's not. He's, no, he's not running for office, Mark. Yeah. Right. That's true. He's not. I he mean, was a Roman citizen, so he had the right to appeal to. Yeah. Rome. That's but it. he's not participating in the political system. Right. Okay. How about Daniel? He wasn't Dan participating. Daniel was first of all. He wasn't involved in the politics. He was a bureaucrat, mm -hmm. and he was a bureaucrat by slavery. So he didn't have a choice. He didn't have a choice, right? Mm -hmm. But I don't think he would have run the, for the position. And Joseph also? Joseph was sold into slavery in Egypt. And was put in that position. And was put in that position. Yeah. Because, but, 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 but that's, right. see, there's a good point there. Because wherever we are, we are to be a blessing. So Joseph was a blessing in Egypt. Mm -hmm. Daniel was a blessing in Babylon. But they weren't part of the political system. They were, they were not part of the political system. I have a driver's license issued to me by the state of Florida. That doesn't make me part of the political system. Okay. It means you're a good citizen. I'm a very good citizen. <laughs> you're except, no peace, except for the fact that I'm not a citizen. <clears throat> I am an alien. Listen, you know, yeah. you, you should know this really well. And, of course, because Mark has traveled with us to places. I mean, he's, you lived with us down in Central America, in Belize, Central America. Traveled to Africa with us. Alice and I have been in, like, 50 countries now we've lived in we've lived in England. We've traveled. We've lived in the Caribbean. We've lived in Central America. We've traveled, uh, spent time in Africa, all over the place. The simple fact of the matter is, 
Like when we lived in, in Belize, I had to pay taxes. I had to obey all of the government authorities, all of the speed limits. I had to write all those things. I had to, same thing in, when we live in England. We have to, I've had a lot of cars in England. I had to go out and I had to get them registered with the state. I had to pay insurance on them. I had to pay the taxes on them. That doesn't make me a citizen. Right? Right. But I am, I am actually, more often than not, or as often as not, I'm, I'm behaving better in those rules than most of the citizens are. I'm telling you that I'm saying that my citizenship is in heaven. I probably do better at obeying the speed limits than 99% of the citizens do. Okay, we, we need to understand that because we are to be a blessing. We are here for a purpose. We are indeed the salt of the earth and the light of the world. But it says that no soldier on active duty, and we are soldiers on active duty. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. I hear the sound of the army of the Lord. We are not to entangle ourselves, entwine ourselves in the world system. And the world system, and by the way, I don't want to get into this too much, but there's a difference between the world and the earth. Yes. All right? We are the salt of the earth. We're the light of the world. The world kind of refers to the, to the world system, to that political system. The earth is about God's creation. Mm -hmm. Okay? Well, the earth is the Lord's. And the, the earth fullness. is the Lord's and the yeah. fullness thereof and all that it contains. Mm -hmm. But this present world, the world system, is in the power of the evil one. First John 5, uh, 19, right? So you need to make these distinctions and you need to understand this. You are to be separate. Come out from their midst and be separate. Mm -hmm. But while you are here in this world, you are to be a blessing because you do what the world can't do. You bring the good news of Jesus Christ. It's unfortunate that so many people put their trust in the government to solve all their problems. How's that worked out for, for you, for anybody? I mean, pick any time in history and say, how's that worked out for you? Because there is only one that you can put your trust in who is faithful, and his name is Jesus Christ. We bring that message. We bring the good news of Jesus Christ. Trust in the Lord. So be on your best behavior, okay? Mm -hmm. But remember... That you're not part of it. You're, you're in the world, but you're not of it. You are here. We are here as ambassadors. Ambassadors, like I said, when we were in any one of the foreign countries we were in, we're there as ambassadors. We represent the kingdom of God. People, you know, people assume, like when we go to these places and we, we speak very differently than even in England. I mean, English is a very different language than American. <laughs> Yes, it is. I mean, I say that, I've said that I'm for, for a dozen years, I go and I'll start to teach or preach in, in the UK and I'll say, you know, you'll, you'll have to give me some grace because I don't speak English. I only speak American. I'm learning how to speak yeah. English. It's got a different, it's, I mean, different vocabulary different and vocabulary. accent. Very, very different. Okay. So uh, people can immediately distinguish you by the way you speak. I mean, while we're in England, people will come up to me and ask me, where are you from? Because they understand right away that we're not from there. Well, you know what? We are supposed to not speak like the world. We have a heavenly language. We have a heavenly language. And I'm not talking about speaking in tongues. Yeah. That's, that's a nice thing. I'm talking about letting no unwholesome word proceed that's from your right. lips. I'm talking about the grace and mercy that's supposed to flow out of us because the tongue of the righteous is a fountain of life. Mm -hmm. The tongue of the righteous is as choice silver. We have that. They don't. So our conversation, our language, should be noticeably different than the world, yes. even here in the United States. You better pray about involvement in politics, okay? And if you're guided by the word, go find it in the word. And don't use, be, be prayerful about using examples like Joseph and Daniel. Because they didn't choose to be involved in politics by any means. Mm -hmm. And nowhere in the New Testament does it say that that's just something that God desires for us to do. We're going to get in. I mean, we've got to talk about this. You've got to look. Let me stop, take a breath and say this. There's nothing more important than what the word says. Amen. That's right. But it's also important what the word doesn't. does not say. Right. And like I said, in 90 years of the early church, it doesn't at all 
talk about involvement in politics. It doesn't suggest that you do. It doesn't command that you do. Let me make one other point that you might want to address. You could say that democracy was not a prevalent political system at the point, at that point. Not like America is today where they vote people in. They didn't have that back then. But democracy is a Greek philosophy. We did a, we did a very serious teaching on that probably a long time mm -hmm. ago as we started our, our study on the In Search of Christianity. Mm -hmm. You know, Paul, in his letter to the Colossians, talks about not being swayed by philosophy. Well, democracy is, as Mark just said, it is indeed a Greek philosophy. Mm -hmm. It was invented in Greece. Okay, that's where democracy comes from. Mm -hmm. And it's what it means is that the people rule. Right. That's what democracy means. And authority flows from the top down. Democracy is from the bottom up. That's the wrong direction. It's not just democracy. Anything other than godliness comes from the bottom up. Right. This present world is in the power of the evil one. That's as bottom as you can get. Right. That's <laughs> as yeah, bottom as you can get. He wants to turn it upside down. But, I, but the fact of the matter is, and as Mark said, this is really important. Democracy is about authority flowing from the bottom up. It's, mm -hmm. it's, Im it's embedded in the Constitution of the United States. Yes. It says that the leaders of this country lead, they rule by the governed. at the consent of the governed. Okay? It comes from the bottom up. Jesus Christ stood in front of Pontius Pilate, who represented all of the world power at the time. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. he, was the, he was the ambassador of the, the, the Caesar. And he was astounded that Jesus wasn't impressed by that. Right. When, Jesus, when he said to Jesus, don't you know I have the power to put you to death? And Jesus don't you said, know who I am? Yeah. And, and Jesus said to him, you would have no authority mm. except my father in heaven gave it to you. He didn't say except the, the emperor gave it to you. He said, my father in heaven gave it to you. Okay. We need to get this straight, particularly in these days, because it is ever, ever, ever so important. Mm. And we're not getting it straight. Mm. I can tell you that because I see how embroiled and entwined the church is in politics, not just here in America, but virtually every place we travel. That's it. I have a Lord. I have one Lord. No man can serve two masters. Mm -hmm. Okay. But that doesn't mean that we our right relationship with the government is to be praying for them. Absolutely. Right. Praying for what? That they'll be nice people? Praying that they'll do what we want? That's not what we're supposed to be God's praying. Will be okay? Done. That God's will be done, all right? We should be praying that, well, we have a ministry of reconciliation. Mm -hmm. We should be praying for their salvation. We should pray that it's not about, you know, whoever's in power here in the United States, whoever is the president of the United States by the will of the people, okay, he needs to get a right relationship with God the Father. That's right. And that is only. That's not available by a majority vote. That is only available by the vote of one. It is only available because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ, his atoning work on the cross. That's our ministry is to bring that word, to bring the knowledge of the presence of Christ Jesus, to bring the good news, to bring that word of reconciliation, to bring that love of God into every place in this planet. I just thought of another example. G uh, the people around G Jesus a few times wanted to make Jesus king. They were zealots. Yeah, the zealots. They yeah. wanted to become involved in politics. Mm -hmm. They wanted to be involved in politics by making Jesus king. Mm -hmm. That's involved in politics. And, and, he, and he wouldn't do it. He didn't have any. He said, no. <laughs> because it's not his plan. You want to, if you want Jesus to be in charge, then here's what you should pray. Even so, come, come Lord, Lord Jesus. Jesus. Because when he comes back a second time, he is going to be in charge. All right, let me move right along, zipping right along to verses 3 and 4. Talking about making entreaties and prayers for them, right? Mm -hmm. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So that's telling us what we should be praying. And so doing. Be saved. <laughs> and doing. Those who call upon the, Paul wrote in his letter to the Romans, those who call upon the name of the Lord, they shall be saved. But how will they call upon the name of the Lord if they don't know who he is, if they've not heard? And how will they hear if it's not preached? 
And how will it be preached if the preachers are not sent? sent? Mm -hmm. Okay? If you care about the government, pray for them. Yes. Pray for the salvation, for a real salvation, the real right relationship with the Lord God Almighty through the atoning work of Jesus. And I don't care what they're like. See, this is the problem. I was, I was so upset years ago, not, not long ago, when... There was a, you know, people were talking about, shall we pray for President Obama? Because the conservative branch of Christianity hated mm. President Obama. And I saw people actually saying, okay, we'll pray for him to die. That's terrible. Absolutely mm -hmm. terrible. It's, it's ungodly is the word you're yeah. looking for. It's so ungodly. We should have been praying for Osama bin Laden, too. Well, that's why enemies. would we, why enemies. Would we do that? Mm. Mm. Pray for mm. the Pope. It says pray for your enemies. But I say to you. <laughs> to get saved. Love your enemies. This is Jesus Christ. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Matthew 5, 44 and 45. Are you praying for, the, for those radical Muslims? Mm. Are you praying for them? The only reason that we're reading what Apostle Paul wrote was because somebody... Now, remember, That's this right. man, so he was the ISIS of his day. He That's had right. purposed in his heart to destroy Christianity. That's right. He was on his way to destroy Christianity when he encountered the risen Savior on the road to Damascus. But you know what? He had heard the good news of Jesus Christ. When he was there while they were stoning Stephen, stoning him to death, and Paul was in such hearty agreement that he's holding the coat so they can throw the stones harder. But he heard Stephen say, Father, do not hold this against them. He prayed what Jesus prayed on the cross, Father, forgive them. That was a seed that was planted in, the, in him mm -hmm. that bore fruit on that road to Damascus. And that stoning Stephen to death was an illegal act. Well, that doesn't matter. I, listen, don't be surprised. You know, Peter wrote and said, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal that comes upon you for your testing. Don't expect righteous behavior. Have you ever heard me say this? Don't expect righteous behavior from unrighteous people. Do you think people in government act legally? Well, here's the Sanhedrin. They, they didn't do have... things wrong all the time. It's a mark. This is part... Stop and think about it. If the world system is in the power of the evil one, who is a liar by nature and the father of lies, who rather than, he has no love, he is, God is love. You want to something? Satan is hate. Yes. Mm. He, he is hatred embodied. Does he have a body? Well, the, the point is, don't be surprised that the, the world is doing wrong. They don't know how to do anything other than being wrong. And whose responsibility is that? Well, this is why it says, and, and, and Paul wrote to the Corinthians and said, listen, don't judge those outsiders. Mm. They don't know any better. How are they going to know better? Because we bring the love of God, the word of God, so that they will know what God desires. The light of the world, the salt of the earth. Okay. I mean, this is, this is serious, serious stuff. Let me just move along to, to 1 Timothy 2.5, all right? Mm -hmm. For there is one God yes. and one mediator be, also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. There's only one God, and he is the one who leads us in paths of righteousness. Mm -hmm. He is the one who is our good shepherd. He is the one who brings us beside still waters and the green pastures. He is the one who protects us. He is the one that we can have this confidence. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. That's not the government. No. I, am, I have no fear of Russia. I have no fear of China. I have no fear North of... Korea. North Korea, I have no fear of the Crips or the Bloods. I have no fear of MS-13 because I have one who is the defender of my life, the mm -hmm. defense of my life, and his name is Jesus Christ. Whatever happens, we need to be praying for those people. Yes. Yes. Not, not hiding from them because we're so afraid. But there's only one mediator between God and man. So one means one, okay? Mm -hmm. In the Hebrew, in the Greek, one means one. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Just think about this. 
early in church history, John the Baptist was beheaded, right? Yeah. Yes. Matthew 14, which talks about Herod, <clears throat> his head chopped off. We just talked about Stephen. Er, early in the life of the church, he was stoned to death. James, the brother of John, Herod, chopped his head off and saw that it pleased the people to do that. He was getting ready to persecute everybody, right? So here you have three saints of God. And by the way, we're all saints, right? But here you have three faithful servants of God who all died early, were, were executed, died, were killed mm -hmm. early in the life of the church. Martyred. Martyred. So for the next 60 years of church life, how often do you see the church praying to them? No. Never. <laughs> you want to take note of that fact? You want to take note of that fact? There's one. Because there's only one. There's only one mediator between God and man, and that's Jesus, right? The early church neither prayed for or to the dead. We got to learn from the from the history of the church. Mm -hmm. The practice didn't start within ninety years. I mean that, that ninety years of nowhere do you see the church praying to or for the dead. Was that a pagan practice? It absolutely was, and it was a pagan practice. It was brought into the church and really became incorporated. Be, became it became a, a functional part of the church. Mm -hmm. As the church went into time, the time of Constantine and went into, uh, uh, this isn't the place for that, right? Why would it ever exist? When you have, listen to this. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. Therefore, because of that, we have that high priest. Let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. So that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Hebrews 4, 15 and 16. We have the, the ability to go before the Lord God Almighty because of the grace of God. Amen. In Ephesians 3, 11 and 12, it says, This was in accordance with the eternal purpose which he, God, carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and confident access through faith in him. We have access to the throne of grace because That's of Jesus. Jesus. Mm -hmm. Why do I need to go to Ralph over there who passed away 18 years ago to try and get access to the throne? Jesus died and lives, and he is the one that opened the door to the throne of grace for me. 1 John 5, 14 says this, 14 and 15. This is the confidence which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request which we have asked from him. We All we got to be doing is praying to the Lord God through his son, Jesus Christ, praying his will. His will. Okay. Well, that went faster than I thought. Wow. No time to go. <laughs> uh, it's going to get, there's some really, really interesting things coming up here. And I'd like you to be back next week for it. As we talk about sex, gender bending, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh -huh. That's certainly one of the hot topics of the time that we live in right now. When you start talking about transgender, this gender, that gender, there's like, you know, there's more genders than there are Heinz varieties. Fifth, yeah. Heinz 57. Yeah. But the fact of the matter is God has a plan. God always has an answer, and there's always a godly way. So we're going to talk next week. We'll get into this. We're going to talk about the two sexes, the three genders, and the one solution that God has given that we would avoid all the confusion. So you might want to be back for that. But until then, Father, we just thank you that we don't have to wait till next week to hear from your Holy Spirit, Lord God, that your spirit you have placed within us that we have complete access, we can come confidently before you and have conversations with you, Lord. That we can bring you our requests, we can bring you our questions, we can bring you our lives surrendered to you for your purpose, Lord God. 
Help us to understand what we are and who we are in Christ Jesus, that we might be that faithful witness to your love and power. I just ask that, Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. amen. See you next week. Be back. Bye, Jesus.